Thank you, Jesus. I love you, mighty God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. We love you, God. We worship you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, mighty God. We thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy, Lord God. Hallelujah. Oh, yes, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, God. Lord Jesus, we exalt you, mighty God, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Jesus' name, Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord God. We worship you. We exalt you, Lord God. Hallelujah. Thank you, God, for your grace. Thank you for your mercy, God. Hallelujah. Thank you, mighty God. <clears throat> the name of Jesus. Well, good day, friend. Pastor Daniel Dagan here. Hope Apostolic United Pentecostal Church, Port Charlotte, Florida. Welcome you here to our online Bible study, Friday, 1 p.m. We like to call this session Prophecy Live, and we have been teaching here every Friday, 1 p.m. since mid-March on end-time-related subjects. And today we want to get into our lesson in a few moments, and we want to do an overview today of the Olivet Discourse, specifically what's recorded in Matthew 24. Before we do, let me just mention to you, some perhaps may not know, this is our latest book. It is on end time prophecy. It's 340 pages. It's copyrighted with an ISBN number, and it's um, a great resource. You can order it through our website, hopeapostolicupc.org. Up at the top, click online store, and it'll take you through all the descriptions from there. And um, we'll ship it out to you just within a few days, and I trust I'll be a blessing to you. Well, let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you, mighty God, for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. God, that you would give us clarity of mind, a focus in our spirit, God, as we draw together and look into thy word. God, push back every hindrance, push back every distraction, in Jesus' name. And Father, speak to us today. And let your spirit and your word work in concert together, God, releasing revelation. Father, that your anointing would prevail and be exalted, mighty God. Thank you for all things. We give you praise in Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen, amen. Well, we welcome you to a Bible study. I love it when you will just post a little comment about where you're watching from, if it's a city or state or country. I really like that. It helps us to be able to pray for you and for yours. And I love you, Brother David Leard. You're my friend, buddy. Well, we want to get started here today, and we want to just go to Matthew 24. And I have felt directed to teach on this today because in my observation, experience, when you discuss end-time prophecy, one of the places that typically garners the greatest amount of questions and for some people generates the greatest number of points of confusion is the Olivet Discourse. And it's recorded in Mark 13, Luke 21. I'm going to study what's recorded in Matthew 24, that version or that recording, if you will, of the Olivet Discourse. And when you overlay all three passages Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, the synoptic gospels as they're called. When you overlay them, they're very much the same. It's very close. But I want to look at Matthew 24, and I'm not going to do a verse-by-verse -verse detailed exposition of it. It would take several weeks to do that. And through the last several weeks from mid-March to present, Friday, 1 p.m., I've been teaching on end-time prophecy, and I've taught a lot already out of Matthew 24, incorporated into the different lessons about the tribulation, about the fig tree blossoming, about the rapture, and so forth. But I want to look at it today from an overview, from an overview. And I want to really highlight in today's study, trying to get a feel for the layout, for the layout and the flow of Matthew 24. And, and is there 
for some portions of it a targeted audience? Is it being directed to a particular group? I think as we study the scriptures, it's very, very important to give attention to not just what's being said, obviously, clearly, that's number one. But it's very, very important to give attention to the context. Who's saying it? What's said before? What's said after? Is there any relative points in terms of time, manners, customs, so forth? So we're going to look into that a little bit today without getting too deep off into the weeds. I want to first just highlight a couple of things. I want to work through this chapter in this overview since verse 1, Matthew 24, down to around verse 36, time permitting. And, and as we work through this, I just want to highlight something on the front end. Okay, we'll get there and we'll read through some of these. But I want you to give attention to, from verse 14 down to verse 36, just make a note of this. It seems to have, especially in that portion of the text, Matthew 24, verse 14 to 36, it seems to have a very strong Jewish focus and overtone. Okay, first of all, Matthew is a gospel that was targeting, written to the Jews. And that's a lesson for another day. But when you get into the language, when you see how the Messiah is presented, when you study the statement kingdom and yea, the gospel of the kingdom, when you study those statements in the book of Matthew, uh, many scholars I have looked at, scholars tend to agree that this is a gospel that was targeting the gospel, the entire 28 chapters, is a gospel that's targeting, yea, it was written to the Jewish people. I agree. It benefits everybody. It's an intricate part of the foundation of the word of God that every believer holds to and stands upon. I agree with that. But in the context, it was written directly to, specifically to the Jewish people. But now let's, in lieu of, let's look at just a couple of statements in Matthew 24, 14 to 36, and then I'll go back to the beginning of the chapter. But I just want you to just grab a few things here. When you look in verse 14, you see a statement, <clears throat> the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom, it's going to be preached. Verse 15, abomination, desolation. Also verse 15, you see the mention of the prophet Daniel, the holy place. Daniel's a prophet of Old, Old Testament, 12 chapters in his book written largely to the nation of Israel. He is the prophet to Israel. And the holy place is a reference to the temple of God. Verse 16, there's a reference there to Judea. Verse 20 of Matthew 24, Sabbath day. And then on from there, the elect's sake. And we're going to get deeper into this. But I want you just to highlight there several references, even the parable of the fig tree later in the chapter. All of those clearly tie a large portion of this chapter directly to the nation of Israel. So just chew on that. Keep a note of that. We'll come back to it as we work through this. Now let's go to Matthew 24. And we'll begin to work down, verse 1 down to verse 3. This is an introduction. Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Well, this is a prophecy about what's coming. You remember Titus, the general, then later he becomes the emperor, Titus, the Roman. When he besieges, begins to besiege Jerusalem in the latter months of 68 AD, Jerusalem begins to fall. The last thing that falls in Jerusalem is the temple. And history records, Josephus writes about it, that the temple fell because ultimately Titus's army began to shoot flaming arrows through the windows in the temple and it began to burn and ultimately that's what allowed them to take the temple. And when it was over and the different scribes and the Jewish uh, 
ministry had begun to scatter. It's there that it's believed that they took the parchments or the scrolls, the transcribed recorded scrolls that had been recorded over and over. It's believed that's when they took them and ultimately they would hide them in what's come to be known as the Caves of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And it was there in the early 1940s that they were found. They were believed to have been put there, what we call the Dead Sea Scrolls that was found over 10 years, a massive Isaiah scroll and others. It's believed that they were probably put there by the essence and other scribes that fled from Jerusalem at 70 AD when the temple fell. And, and then Jesus gives his prophecy in Matthew 24 and 2 that one stone won't be left upon another, specifically speaking of the temple. And history tells us again that after the temple was burned and pillaged by Titus and the Roman army, that as the fire begins to dissipate, that the Romans came and they literally turned over just about every stone, about every stone. Why? So they could scrape the gold off of the stones for their treasury. So they could take the precious valuables of the temple for their treasury, much like as it was done in the days of Babylon, how they had taken the treasury from Solomon's temple. Here in the days of the New Testament, the days of Herod, this temple was pillaged 70 AD. And that's what Jesus is speaking of in Matthew 24 and 2. Can I have an amen if you're with me here today? And then here at the Mount of Olives, he came and he sat. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately. So he would teach in the temple by day. And at this point in scripture, he would rest by night in the Mount of Olives. And the disciples came unto him privately saying, tell us, and here's three questions. These three things are addressed in the Olivet Discourse. Again, the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21 believed by scholars, I certainly agree with it, to be the most comprehensive, detailed, and broad look at end-time prophecy given by Jesus in the days of his flesh. Given by Jesus in the days of his flesh. And, and we launch into that. And he goes into it, yea, speaking three statements, and he will address them as he works through this Olivet Discourse. So he says here in verse 3, as he speaks to his disciples privately, they would say, tell us, when shall these things be? When shall, on the backdrop of the comments about the temple, no stone being left upon another, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So those are the three things that the Olivet Discourse speaks to. Those are the three things that he's speaking to. Now, let me begin to just insert, and I'll make comments as we move through this today. Let me insert some just thoughts, okay? It helps me to see and to understand this portion of Scripture. Now, I wouldn't say it if I didn't feel like it was absolutely sound doctrine and right. I wouldn't say it if I could not defend it under scrutinization. So, let me just make a comment. I really view verse 4 down to verse 8 into verse 9, verse 4 down to verse 8 into 9. I view that portion as directly speaking to what I'm going to call the church age believer. The church age believer. Verse 4, and I'm going to explain it as we work through it a little bit. Verse 4 down to and into verse 9, what's called the beginning of sorrows. It's clear to me, we read it, even in the life of the apostles, consider Stephen, the first martyr in the New Testament church, Acts 7. Consider uh, John the Baptist was beheaded prior to the establishing of the New Testament church. And, and many others, uh, both uh, James, it's recorded in the book of Acts, was martyred for his faith. And then many of the other apostles, save John, the beloved, died as martyrs, died as martyrs. John, they tried to kill him, boil him in oil. He lived and he dies of old age later after writing the book of Revelation. But, but it's clear that the New Testament church suffers much persecution. When I say New Testament church. I'm not just talking about the church of the first century. 
I'm talking about the church today up until the rapture of the church. Clearly, the New Testament church suffers much persecution, much hardship, trial, travail, and tribulations. Trials, difficulties, tribulations. I did not say the seven years of tribulation. But the church does go through much persecution. It's taken place up to this point. It's taken place now. In North America, it certainly seemed like it's intensifying. All of these different situations where they're telling us not to sing, not to play music. We can't meet in church buildings. We have to meet outside very small groups. They're limiting, very restrictive against uh, church and Christian religious groups and so forth. I think that's a, the type of persecution. So notice what he says. I think this is pointedly directed to the church. He says in verse 4 down to verse 9, Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. So you'll notice this is an absolute reoccurring theme of the end times. And even after, even after the rapture of the church, deception through the false prophet and such, Deception is great. Uh, Paul writes about this in, in first and second Timothy in those different places. So it's very important that we understand that in the last days, I think certainly even in the church age prior to the rapture, deception is going to become even more and more common and rampant. You read about the book of Jude, you read uh, the closing chapter to Second Peter, you read Acts chapter 20, verse 26 down. There's many, many warnings, Second Peter 4, first, I'm sorry, Second Timothy 4, and other places. There's many warnings about deception, deception. Even the very elect shall be deceived if it be possible. So it's one of the signs of the end. Deception was the first trap that Satan used against mankind in the garden. It will be the last thing that he uses after the thousand year period in which he's bound by the chain in the bottomless pit. Go back and read the closing verses of Revelation 20. It says he will be released. Satan will be released one final time from the bottomless pit. That's not hell, Guiana, the lake of fire. It's a bottomless pit. He will be released one final time. And when he's released, it says the weapon that he goes to is his first weapon that he used in the garden. Deception deception. So deception is a great tool and tactic of Satan. And what protects you from that and helps you overcome that is the Bible, is the word of God and, and trusted voices of counsel and authorities. We continue verse six, another point, and you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye, <clears throat> excuse me, see that ye be not troubled for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Excuse me. So he says wars and rumors of wars. And then he says all of these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. So we're seeing that now. Military conflicts around the world. I, I, I believe that this is also a reference to Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39. That's, that's what many scholars call World War III. World War III. It, it involves not just Gog and Magog, but there's actually a different sides and list of different countries and the battling over the spoils of Israel and the valuable treasures of Israel. Oil is part of that. And, and that's going to be the focal point of that Ezekiel 38-39 conflict involving Gog, Magog, which is Russia, the ancient na name of Russia. Magog is the uh, ancient word used for Moscow. So that's a reference to that wars and rumors of wars. I believe certainly the church is present for that. The church is present for that. Ezekiel 38, 39. What's going to be identified, I believe, by World War III, many scholars agree with that. I think that's that's that reference there, wars and rumors of wars, that preludes and introduces the cry for peace as never before, with the Antichrist rising, promising peace, bringing about the alliance of the Ten Nation Union, the Ten Horns, the Ten Toes, and so forth. So we continue moving. I think all of the initial verses of Matthew 24 
4 down to 8 into verse 9 is pointing towards and speaking of the time of the church. Verse 6, And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of war, see that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. So he's speaking to the disciples, but clearly they're the, not the ones that see this. Okay, He's speaking generationally to them. Then he says in verse 7, for nation or ethnos shall rise against nation, nation against nation or ethnos. That's a Greek word, ethnos or ethnic group, race, race. Ethnos against ethnos or race against race, kingdom against kingdom. There should be famines, pestilences, pestilences, diseases, COVID-19. It's a disease that's touched the world to a magnitude as no other before. There's been nothing that's touched the world like this in terms of the numbers, in terms of the massive far reach of COVID-19, the malaria, smallpox, influenza, all of these things, but nothing's comparable to COVID-19, not globally. And then he goes on earthquakes in diverse places. Then he says here in verse eight, all these are the beginning of sorrows. So, so think about the, the birthing pains, the beginning of birth pains, okay? corresponding with a great birthing. I think these trials, these beginning of sorrows, the church is present for that. We're seeing it now. The chaos in our streets, the uncertainty, the military uh, battles and conflicts, the racial tension, and literally an uncertainty surrounding economic markets, the political arena, the military arena, and so forth. We're seeing that now. COVID-19 pestilences and, and looting and riots and all of that being shut out of churches and quarantined. We're seeing that the beginning of sorrows. So it's very traumatic and it's very intense and it's painful sorrows, painful, hurtful. But then also think about the woman giving birth. Uh, what does it say in Isaiah 66, 7 and 8, who have heard of such a thing for, uh, Zion, when she travailed, she brought forth her children. Without travail, there's no birthing. Well, I think also the beginning of sorrows, it also speaks of those labor pains, the difficulties and the pain of it. And also in the same breath, say, I believe it represents the ushering in of the last and final greatest in gathering, yea, that latter form of rain together. I believe those birth pains usher in that last Joel to great, great visitation of God before the catching away of the bride of Christ, before the rapture. And we continue moving here in verse 9. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. So through verse 8 and into verse 9, in my mind's eye, I see the church being present there, and then and then I see a transition, and then I see a transition, verse 10, moving on down from here, say amen if you're with me here today, verse 10 of Matthew 24, teaching an overview on the Olivet Discourses, great expansive look of end time prophecy given to us by Jesus towards the end of his earthly ministry. It says, forgive my voice here. It says in Matthew 24, verse 10, Then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because of iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. So now, verse 10 down, I begin to view some of these statements as being directly applicable to the apostate, to the apostate church. And I do agree, I do agree that the apostate body, and it's not a church building, it's not one congregation exclusively in totality, it's not that you walk up to a church and it says, welcome to the first apostate church of whatever city, no. When you study about, and I'm going to get into in a few weeks, after the Thanksgiving holiday, I'm going to get into a study, multiple week study of the seven churches of Revelation 2 and 3. And as we move through those, we'll get to ultimately Philadelphia and Laodicea. And I think those two represent the temperament of the last day church. Literally, literally, remember Jesus said, 
the wheat and the tares grow together. Remember, the wheat and the tares grow together. Well, Philadelphia is the church that receives no rebuke from God. When you read the text, go back and study it, Revelations 2 and 3. It's the beloved church. It's a great church. They've stood in the eyes of God's favor. There's, there's no rebuke that's given to the church in Philadelphia. But then when you get to Laodicea, Laodicea is, is the church that receives the sharpest rebuke. The sharpest rebuke. It is there, Philadelphia and Smyrna of the seven received no rebuke. Laodicea and Sardis of the seven received the strongest rebuke. I'll teach on them later, probably in the early weeks of December. The seven churches of Asia Minor. They were seven literal churches that existed in the second part of the first century. Seven literal congregations. But not only were they seven literal congregations, I also believe, and I hold too, that they represent the attitude, the mentality of the church present within God's global church from the birthing of the church in Acts 2 up until the rapture. And I do see some of these as having some overlap, and we'll get into that when we teach that lesson. But in the last day, Prior to the rapture, it's clear to me that there's some overlapping within, might I say, the broad, if I can just throw a blanket over it, the broad covering of God's ecclesia, the broad covering of God's church. And in that broad congregation, I see present in the same house, if you will, vessels of honor and vessels of dishonor. I see present in the same house, the wheat and the tares growing together. Jesus said, don't separate them. I'm the Lord of the harvest. I'll come and I'll separate them. And it's a lot of teaching there. And I can make a lot of separate related comments I'm not going to. But prior to the rapture, I think every honest pastor would say in the congregation, the honor to lead God's church, that they have some great saints of God that represent like the church of Philadelphia. They're the pure gold. They're just committed. They love the doctrine. They're sold out for God. They serve God day by day. They're a picture of, of what a saint should be. And I say that, but by God's grace, okay? But then I think every honest pastor would also say we can never say names. We can never single anybody out. Of course we can't. But I think every honest pastor would also say they're present in the same congregation. There's some people that are double-minded. That's why the Bible says, let judgment begin where? In the streets? No. In the hedges and highways? No. It says, let judgment first begin in the house of God. Let judgment first begin in the house of God. Why? Because prior to the rapture, even within the same congregation, there's going to be a representation of both the true bride of Christ and the apostate and the apostates, they're together, they're together. And, and the picture is given to us actually later in the same chapter, Matthew 24, towards the very end, it's given two in the bed, one taken, one left, two on the rooftop, one taken, one left, two in the field, one taken, one left, two at the wheel grinding, one taken and one left. Yea, let judgment begin in the house of God, some taken and some left. So with that being said, I think we transition now in Matthew 24, well, I feel the Holy Ghost sitting down upon us. Verse 10 down to verse 13. And I think verse 10 down to verse 13, I, I agree. On a secondary level, some of these statements could still apply to the church age. But I more so see them applying to the apostate after the church has been raptured. After the church has been raptured. And the apostate will rise. And it's a lot of teaching here. I'm just trying to do an overview, but um, the apostate rises. As you consider Daniel 2, Daniel 2, the image of Nebuchadnezzar's dream is absolutely a paramount anchoring point. It's like a chief cornerstone to understand prophecy. And when you move down through that and the interpretation of it from Babylon, the Babylonian empire following the Egyptians following the Assyrians, the Babylonian Empire, then the Medo-Persian Empire. It's a lot of teaching here. The Grecian Empire, then the Roman Empire. Then you come down to there, the, the toes and the feet, both iron and clay, or might I say mara clay mixed together. That's representative of the fifth empire seen in Daniel 2, this image. Yea, that's, that's this type of uh, revived 
or papal Roman Empire or the papal system. What is that? That is a revived Roman Empire or a revived type of. This government blending together, government Rome iron seen in the toes, mixing with the clay, the mora clay, the mora clay. What's that? That's this apostate church. Remember, God's true church is as the clay shaped and molded, but then the mora clay. I've taught on this previously in the same time slot. The mora clay blending with the iron in the ten toes, the union of church and government coming together with the plausible one world religion. That is that apostate church. And who sits on that apostate church? That's none other than the mother whore. That's the mother whore and you have the false prophet lording over that. The mother whore and the false prophet or the second beast working with the Antichrist in the seven years of tribulation, Daniel's 70th week. So these descriptions, yes, it, some of them applies to the church age um, specifically pointed towards the apostate believers, the double-minded believers, the carnal believers, like Hymenaeus and Alexander. Paul says, I've given you over to shipwreck. Here are the statements in Matthew 24, verse 10 to 13. I hope you're with me. Can you give me an amen if you're with me here now? He says in Matthew 24, verse 10, Then shall many be offended, shall betray one another, shall hate one another. Many false prophets shall rise shall deceive many deceptions, been one of Satan's tactics from the beginning to the ending. I've already addressed that today. Because of iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. That's absolutely one of the earmark signs of the end. Men will invent evil. They have no compassion one for another. They're fierce, so forth. Verse 13, he that shall endure until the end, the same shall be saved. So, Verse 13 on down, this is where we begin to get this strong, this is where we begin to get this strong Jewish tone of this passage. And this is why I deviate. Um, some people have a different view, and I've studied it out, and if you see it differently, God bless you, I'm not going to fuss and cuss with you. But some people have a different view, and, and they really chalk up some of the statements towards uh, verse 27 down as being proof of a post-tribulation rapture. Well, I've taught several hours since mid-March, the same time slot, on why the Bible presents it as a pre-tribulation rapture. I'm not going to reteach that now. But but I think one of the reasons why people misinterpretate and come to wrong conclusions about Matthew 24, they fail to see the Jewish theme of it, especially from verse 13, 14 forward. Especially from verse 13, 14 forward. So let me let me get into this with you right now. When, when you begin to get into verse 14, I alluded to it earlier, but let me just make another comment about it right now. Verse 14 reads, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. I've had people take me there in discussions and dialogue, and I welcome them. Don't contact me if you're not a pastor or if you don't have your pastor's approval. But I welcome dialogue and conversation. I'm not going to just hear you. I'm going to hear you, measure it, scrutinize and examine it according to Scripture. I'm going to respond to you as kindly and as graciously as I can. But I've had people come to me, and I say that humbly. I'm not trying to be heavy-handed. But I've had people come to me before and go to Matthew 24, 14 and say, See there, the gospel still being preached, so that's proof that the church is still present during this time of the tribulation, during this time. I would stop the tape there and say this. As I've already mentioned, Matthew's a gospel written that targets largely the Jewish people. But beyond that, you understand that whenever Jesus was present upon the earth, in the days of his flesh, his earthly ministry, those 33 plus years, most of his preaching and teaching was captured over those last three, three and a half years. That's when he launches his earthly ministry. When he preached and taught, do you realize the Bible says that he preached the gospel? Matthew 3, 2, Mark 1, 14, 15, Mark 9, 6. He preached the gospel. He came preaching the gospel. Well, what was that? He was reaching and preaching to the nation of Israel. As John before him done, he was calling Israel back to himself, 
calling them to repent. That's why it's identified here as the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom. Well, you understand that the message that Paul preached, death, burial, resurrection. I'm not going to get too deep into this. I'll give you the references. Go back and look at it. But the message that Paul preached, the new birth message of salvation, the plan of salvation from Acts 2 forward until the rapture of the church. What was that? That was death, burial, and resurrection. Paul himself defines, explains that as such in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. He says, I have preached the gospel unto you. And he explains death, repentance, burial, baptism, water baptism in the only saving name, the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and being filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost with the initial sign of tongues. Paul defines the gospel that way to the church, yea, that he preached during the church age. That message, yea, the gospel, death, burial, resurrection, it could not be preached until Jesus died upon the cross. So when you read about Jesus during his earthly ministry, as it's recorded in the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and it says he preached the gospel. It was a gospel of the kingdom to the Jews, telling them, drawing them to repent, drawing them back to him, a gospel of the kingdom. That's what's talked about in Jesus' preaching. And when you see this statement pointing towards the end, the gospel of the kingdom, the same language is used during the seven years of tribulation when you get into Revelation chapter 6 to 18. What is that? What is the book of, uh, what is the writings of the tribulation about? What's the focal point in the book of Revelation chapter 6 to 18? It is about Israel turning back to God. That's what the tribulation is about. The gospel of the kingdom is tied to that. Israel repenting and turning back to God. Turning back to God, yea, launching into the millennial kingdom. So I do not read verse 14 as a reference to the church. The church is identified and in part classified as the times of the Gentiles. I do not read the reference there, gospel of the kingdom, as proof that that church is still in the earth until the end, post-tribulation rapture. Because that statement, gospel of the kingdom, has nothing, zero, nothing to do with what Paul preached, Acts 2, 38, death, burial, resurrection. Paul says, writing to the church of Galatia, 1, 8, and 9, if I or an angel come from heaven preaching another gospel, let him be accursed. That statement was to the church, written by a member of the church, inspired to write it by Paul. And he speaks to a member of the church, to the church in Galatia, and he tells them about what's preached during the church age. So we continue moving. Another clear Jewish reference, verse 15. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation. So again, that places this text in the in the arena of the Jews. He is writing to and speaking to the Jews, the abomination desolation. You understand the times of the Gentiles has not even begun yet, right? At the time that Matthew's written, the times of the Gentiles has not even begun yet. The New Testament church has not even begun yet. They don't even have a canonized New Testament at this point. So what they have is is the law and the Psalms and the prophets. That's, that's their word. Jesus calls it that multiple times. So as they stand upon the Old Testament scriptures, those 39 books, they're referencing, Jesus is referencing back to that. And he's making references to the Jewish prophet Daniel and the abomination desolation that was talked about. That is a theme that the Jews are going to understand that the Jews are going to understand. This is targeting and written to the Jews. Much of this is about what God's going to do for Israel. It's not written. It's not explaining. It's not speaking to the Gentiles. Hallelujah. He says also in verse uh, 15, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, who shall read it, let him understand. So he is, because the Jews have a knowledge of it, he is using that as a point of reference. He's writing to the Jews. 
Abomination and desolation happens at the midpoint of the tribulation, 1260 days, a 42 month point, when the Antichrist sets himself up in the temple to be worshiped and he breaks the covenant, Daniel 9, 27 covenant. Verse 16, then let them which be in Judea, so it's very Pacific. The passage is targeting and speaking to the Jews. Let them which be in Judea flee unto the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house, neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. Woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck to those days. Pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. So this is again a point of reference that places this context. These admonishments points him directly towards the Jews. He is addressing the Jews concerning what is going to take place during the seven years of tribulation. This is not pointed to, this is not targeted towards the church, the Gentile church. It is targeted to Israel, the Jews. And, and there's a reference to the Sabbath. Who better would understand that than the Jews, okay? Paul even writes to the to the mixed blended church during the times of the Gentile Jew and Gentile. Paul even writes that we no longer have to honor or respect one day over another day. And, and he deals with that, the Sabbath, circumcision, some of these types of things that the Gentile Christians no longer even have to honor those types of things. So this is clearly pointing towards and speaking to the Jews. Okay. Now we continue, we continue moving here. And in verse 21, it begins to explain some things that happens during the second half of the seven years of tribulation. It begins to get into some things that happens during the second half. So we've moved through some of the descriptions of things that happens during the beginning of the seven years of tribulation. We've seen references to the midpoint, the midpoint of the seven years of tribulation, the abomination desolation. Go back and read about the two witnesses in the book of Revelation. Read about the uh, midpoint of the seven years of tribulation. I'll give you chapter and verse right now, and you can go back and look at it. Uh, in Revelation chapter 13 into chapter 14, that's the midpoint of the uh, seven years of tribulation. That is the 1260-day point, the 42-month point. That's when the abomination desolation takes place. But now in verse 21, we begin to transition into the second part of of the seven years of tribulation. Previously in the same time slot, I've taught on the uh, 21 judgments that are experienced during the seven years of tribulation. Go back and study them. They begin in Revelation 6 and 1, the seven seal judgments, the seven trumpet judgments, and then after the midpoint, the seven vile or bold judgments that are poured out clearly. All of these come down from heaven. The angels sound the trumpets from heaven. The seals, yea, the bowls are poured out from heaven, the throne of God, from the presence of God. They come down from heaven. I've had people say that, well, some of these are the wrath of Satan, and then the wrath of the Lamb begins around the, the sixth vile judgment or bowl judgment. That's absolutely not right. That is wrong. From the beginning, the seven seal judgments, the seven trumpet judgments, and the seven vile judgments are all the wrath of the Lamb. Have questions about that? Go back and listen to previous teaching. But it's clear and significant. I've heard people say before, well, the first half of the tribulation is not that bad. Simply put, they've not studied the Bible. It's absolutely devastating. Devastating. But it is true that the second half is much worse much worse. Yea, the second half of the seven years of great tribulation. Verse 21, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world. Uh, no, to this time, no, nor ever shall there be. So this is when it gets horrible. The second half, the last 42 months, the seven point outs of the vials or the bowls. This is a great, great wrath of God. Somebody said, well, it was bad in the days of Noah, days of Lot. There was a city destroyed the days of Noah. The entire earth flooded. That's true. That's true. It rained for 40 days and 40 nights. 
380 days they was upon the boat before it came to rest, the ark. Uh, now, Ararat, that's true, but I want you to notice, in the days of Noah, even as bad as it was for the earth, consider the population then versus the population at the time of the tribulation. We could speculate about how much greater it's going to be at the time of the tribulation. Secondly, days of Noah, the flood, the actual judgment of God, lasted 40 days and 40 nights. It was on the boat approximately 380 days, but the flood lasted 40 days and 40 nights. This will be the worst time. That's why it says it. This will be the worst time that the world has ever experienced since the beginning because it's extended. It's not just 40 days and 40 nights. It's extended from month after month, year after year. Okay, now this is a key point that takes much of Matthew 24, certainly from verse 13 down to verse 36, and it directly applies it in terms of the primary, prim, predominant, uh, primary application and interpretation directly applies it to Israel. This is a key point. Here it is. Are you ready? Verse 22, except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but the elect's sake, hold on to that, those days shall be shortened. Can you go with me right now? I want to take it to two uh, verses, key verses, yea, by another end time Jewish prophet, Isaiah. Isaiah 65 and 9. The key in understanding the verse, verse 22 of Matthew 24, the elect's sake. Who is the elect's sake? Well, it is true as you have the benefit of working through the end of the New Testament at times. The word elect applies to Israel, and at times it applies to the church age believer. I agree with that. We have the benefit of having the 14 Pauline epistles, the seven general epistles, the book of Revelation, and yea, the rest of the gospels in the book of Acts. But let's put ourselves right in the context of Matthew 24 and 22. When it's spoken, they have none of that. They have none of that. So when this was spoken, verse 22, let's look at in the Jewish gospel, in this passage, with several references already clearly pointing the primary application of this passage to the Jews or towards the nation of Israel, let's look at this word, a lake, uh, word elect in light of that. Isaiah 65 and 9. Say amen or type in amen when you have it and we'll read it together. I want to go to first Isaiah 65, Isaiah 65 and verse 9. Isaiah chapter 65 and verse 9. And then I want to go back to 45 and 4 in Isaiah. Isaiah 65, 9. Okay. I will bring forth a seed out of Jacob and out of Judah, inheritor of my mountains, and mine elect shall inherit it, and my servants shall dwell there. So that's clearly with the reference to Jacob and Judah is referring to Israel. And Israel is described as my elect. Go back to Isaiah 45 and 4. Again, we're talking about understanding what the word elect means in Matthew 24 and 22. Notice what it says in Isaiah 45 and 4. Again, for Jacob, my servant. So clearly speaking of Israel and the descendants from the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, mine elect. Do you see that? Israel, mine elect elect. I have even called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. So Israel, my elect, my elect. So again, Matthew's gospel is written to the Jews. Jesus is seen in the 28 chapters of Matthew as a man of activity, as the Messiah. There's 40 quotes about him that ties him to being the Messiah. Numerous times the Old Testament quotes from 
uh, numerous times in the book of Matthew, quotes from the Old Testament, starting out with the lineage, 42 generations of Christ. So it is the Jewish gospel, okay? Multiple references in Matthew 24, verse 13 to 36, that clearly ties that portion of this account of end time prophecies and trying to place these prophecies and understand who he's speaking to and how these are going to be revealed, revealed clearly much of this passage, verse 13 to 36, is uh, directed at the Jews and, yea, the nation of Israel. And then the word elect, that is used in the context of him addressing Israel, prophesying about Israel, the temple, not one stone being upon another, and, yea, Israel, my elect. So it's clear he's speaking about what's going to be experienced by the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, by Israel, yea, by the Jews. This is what's a description of what's going to take place after the times of the Gentiles comes to a close. Let's keep moving here. Okay. And Paul writes about the times of the Gentiles coming to a close. Romans chapter 11, verse 23 of Matthew 24 then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christ, false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they were able to deceive even the very elect. Behold, I have told you before, wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. Verse 27, as for as the lightning cometh out of the east, shineth even in the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. This is a key passage, okay? Some people conclude this is speaking of a post-tribulation rapture of the church, where the church goes through the seven years of tribulation, and then the Lord comes down somewhere around I've heard them say around the sixth vile judgment, the seventh. Some was around that time. They come, he comes down, raptures them, then he comes back, right back down at Armageddon with them. I've heard them dis describe it multiple ways. Well, simply put, when you overlay this description, verse 27 down to about verse 31, when you overlay that description, if that is truly talking about the rapture, I don't believe it is. But if it's truly talking about the rapture and not what's going to take place in Israel when the Lord comes back with the church at Armageddon in, in, the, in the valley of Josaphat, if, if that's really talking about the rapture, the passage here, when you overlay it with 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 down to 18, the, the most significant passage on the rapture, that's agreed upon by scholars. It specifically uses language, then the dead in Christ shall rise first, we which are alive and remain shall be called up to meet him in the air. In that passage, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, 18, the language, the descriptions, the descriptions of what's going on in the earth, the descriptions of what's going on in the sky, in the atmosphere, is totally different than the descriptions that you read here. The, the points that would tie two passages together are not the same. They don't agree. Beyond, I've already established, I think it's very clear, multiple references from verse 13 to 36 that points this directly towards Israel. Israel, during the seven years of tribulation, not to the church. Another point, and, and let me just give it to you, go back and look at it and study it. If, if, the church is still present, and the message of Acts 2.38 is the only message of salvation for the church, which is 100% true. To be born into the kingdom, to be part of God's bride, the church, you must have faith, repent, be baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of sins, be filled with the Holy Ghost with the sign of speaking in tongues. Have a question about that? Go back and watch the four Monday nights of April, same Facebook page, and I've taught about five hours on salvation for the church age. But that's the only message of salvation. I have a question. For anybody that holds to a post-tribulation rapture position, and you're apostolic, you believe you must 
Obey Acts 2.38 to be saved. Can you find in the tribulation passages, Revelation chapter 6.18, can you find one clear reference to somebody being born of the water and of the spirit? You cannot. You cannot. I see multiple references applauding and alluding to the power of the blood. I agree. I read about references of the garments being washed. I agree. But there's no literal references to people speaking in tongues, chapter 6 to 18. There's no literal references to people being filled with the Holy Ghost for the first time speaking in tongues. There's no literal references of people being water baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Why? Because that started with the church and that leaves with the church. The restrainer, that experience, tongue speaking, it leaves with the church. It leaves with the church. That's why you read during the tribulation passage about the message of repentance because it's still being preached. About faith, it's still being preached. About worshiping Jesus, it's still being preached. About obedience, it's still being preached. About the power of the blood, it's still being preached. Those are truths that's been preached from the beginning of time to the end of time. Grace has been preached from the beginning of time to the end of time. But what's unique to the church age is Acts 2.38. And when the church is raptured, that message started with the church and it left with the church. That is why you don't read one time a literal account, literal account, where somebody was baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost with the sign of tongues during any of the tribulation passages. You don't read it. Why? Because the church is not here. If we hold to the apostolic message and we believe the church is still here during the seven years, then you have to do one of two things. You have to either discredit discredit the apostolic truth of Acts 2.38 and lessen the absolute significance of that, or you have to change your position on the rapture. The two do not reconcile together. Let me keep moving. So it goes on here in verse 27, For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For whithersoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together immediately after the tribulation of those days. Shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the power of the heaven shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect. There's that word again, his elect. That's Israel. In the context of the passage, I've already established that. From the four winds, yea, from the end of heaven to the other. So you see that passage. It speaks of the tribes. That's a reference to Israel. It speaks of the elect. That's a reference to Israel. I've already established that. This is what takes place in, in Revelations 19 when he comes to the earth. You read about the descriptions. It's very much in correspondence with what's taking place at the time of the seventh vile judgment going into Armageddon. And that, that time period and that season and the language of Revelation chapter 19. That description does not correspond with, does not correlate with what it says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, 18. You don't read about any of that stuff taking place at the rapture passage in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. Here's a very significant difference, okay, between the rapture and the second coming of Christ. Those are two different things. Titus 2, 13, the glorious appearing, the second coming of Christ. Here's a key point of difference. At the rapture, Jesus does not come to the earth. We're caught up to meet him in the air. At the rapture, he never comes to the earth and puts his feet upon the earth. Are you with me right now? We're caught up to meet him in the air. The dead in Christ rise first. We go up. We go up. And, and then we which are alive and remain are caught up, are caught up to meet him in the air. That's the rapture. Then from there we go into the beginning of the marriage supper of the Lamb and the presentation of the crowns, the bema, the judgment seat of Christ. That's where the believers of church are rewarded. Okay, that begins, that continues up into the end of the seven years in heavenly places. 
Okay, but now we move from the discussion of the rapture. Are you with me? We go to a discussion now of the second coming of Christ. And notice the descriptions, the differences. This is key. Remember uh, Jesus, boy, I feel the Holy Ghost. Remember when Jesus um, rises on the third day, he says, if you destroy this body in three days, I will resurrect my temple. He resurrects himself. He comes out, Luke 24, 45 to 49, Acts 1. He's with them for 40 days, teaching things pertaining to the kingdom of God. He leads them out as far as, as, far as the Mount of Olives, Acts 1, verse 8, verse 9. There's angels there. The men are looking up as they see Jesus ascend up. And then the angel speaks and says, from the same place. Are you catching me right now? Acts 1, verse 8 down. From the same place you've seen him ascend up, he's coming back to that same place. Well, when you read the prophetic book of Zechariah, begin around uh, chapter 14, about verse 7 or so, and you read the second coming of Christ over here. It's different than the rapture. You read the second coming of Christ. This is Armageddon. This is Revelation 19. This is Titus 2.13. This is Matthew 24, 27-31. The second coming of Christ. He comes back to the earth. Here's the difference. The second coming, he comes back to the earth. It is there in the valley of Joseph, Josephat, uh, Basarat, where he gathers together uh, all of the Jews, Israel. And this is where Armageddon takes place. That season of battles takes place. This is where uh, Matthew 24, 27 to 31 is fulfilled. This is where Zechariah 14, 7 down, he puts his feet on Olivet, the same place where he ascended from, is fulfilled. This is where Titus 2, 13, the glorious appearing, is fulfilled. This is where Revelations 19, about verse 10 down, where he comes on the white horse, the armies from heaven, that is both the rapture church and many of the Old Testament saints that were resurrected, Matthew 27, 50 down, were resurrected at the third day when he came out, after the first fruits came forth Christ. They all come back on white horses from heaven with angels to Armageddon following Jesus on that white horse. And that's where he opens up his mouth. And those armies, you remember, the sixth vital judgment, the armies that gather together in alliance with the Antichrist, the ten horns, the ten toes, the ten nation union kings coming together. You remember the sixth vial was when the spirit leaped out of the mouth like a frog of Satan, of the first beast, the Antichrist, of the false prophet, the second beast, and goes forth and manipulates the kings and the armies of the earth, and they come to Armageddon, and Jesus meets them there with the armies of heaven, and he opens up his mouth, and the sword comes out, and he destroys them. All of that takes place in conjunction with the second coming. That is distinctively different. The focus there is Israel, consistent with the 12 tribes mentioned Matthew 24, 30, consistent with the, the elect mentioned in Matthew 24, consistent with all the other references of Israel throughout Matthew chapter 24. So that's a key, key point. Let me just hasten here as I close. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 32 to 36, and forgive my dog, we got the neighbor outside. So Matthew chapter 24, 32 to 36, it is a reference to the fig tree. It's a reference to the fig tree and the fig tree throughout. When you study Hosea 9, 10, when you study Habakkuk 3, 17 to 19, when you study Jeremiah 34, clearly the fig tree is a reference to Israel. So he naturally, in the vein of talking about Israel as he paints a picture of the seven years of tribulation. Who's going to suffer it? Who is the focal point of the seven years of tribulation? Israel. It's all about Israel. When the church is raptured, the times of the Gentiles is over. It's over. I did not say Gentiles won't be saved during the seven years. Just like Gentiles in the Old Testament 
were saved under the covenant with Abraham and his descendants. You remember? Ruth the Moabitess, Rahab the harlot, the other heathen women listed in Matthew 1, the lineage of Christ. Likewise, Jews are saved during the times of the Gentiles. Almost the first five chapters of the book of Acts deals exclusively with during the times of the Gentiles, the Jews being saved. It starts out with almost exclusively the Jews being saved in the upper room, save perhaps the exception of Luke and maybe Titus coming later. And then it turns to the Gentiles. During the seven years of tribulation, the focus is no longer the times of the Gentiles, Romans 11, but it turns back to the first love, the first olive branch, Israel. That's what Matthew 24 paints. The focus of the tribulation is Israel. Multiple other passages establishes that. Where's the temple set up, the tribulation temple set up at during the seven years of tribulation? Jerusalem, Israel. Where does Armageddon take place? There in Israel. In Israel, the valley of Josephat. Where does the Antichrist come and try to reign during the abomination desolation? In Jerusalem, in the temple. All of it focuses upon Israel. It's ultimately them coming to their knees the Jews and acknowledging Christ as Mashiach, something they rejected broadly when he first came. Now he comes back to them and he preaches to them and has the two angels preach to them and has 144,000 declare it and, and has, and has many now will receive the gospel of the kingdom. Repent, come back to Jesus as Messiah preparing to go into the millennial kingdom. The parable of the fig tree closes the lesson today. Matthew 24, verse 32 to 36. And it is clearly a focus upon Israel and the reblossoming of the fig tree. The generation shall not pass. The generation shall not pass. According to Psalms 90 and 10, a generation 70 years. Consider 1882, there were 24,000 Jews in Palestine. 1914, 85,000 Jews in Palestine. 1948, 650,000 Jews in Palestine. 2012, nearly 4 million Jews in Palestine. In January 1st, 2017, six and a half million Jews in Palestine. Earlier this year, according to World Meters um, population gauge, there were over eight and a half million Jews in Palestine. Clearly, the fig tree is blossoming. So that's all tied to Israel. And then Matthew 24 closes up with some references about, I've already made, when God comes, he will judge two in the field, one taking one left, two in the rooftop, one taking one left. So that is an overview of the book of Matthew 24, the Olivet Discourse. Clearly, from verse 13 forward, the focus is the primary and predominant application an interpretation for those prophetic utterances is Israel, not the church, not the church. It is very clear to me, verse 27 to 31, that is not a reference of the rapture, and it does not prove a post-tribulation rapture. It is pointing towards the second coming of Christ and what he does in Israel. Do not get confused by words like elect. I've already explained it. Trump trumpet. They mean different things at different places. You have to really unpack the text to come to understand it. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your grace, for your love, for your mercy. Father, go with your people. Help us to see greater revival. Help us, God, to draw comfort out of the prophetic scriptures. Help us to be stirred. Help us to compel others to serve you. And let us be ready, making a call on an election sure. Be exalted, God, in all things. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen, amen. Have a question, please email me, pastordagan at gmail.com. God bless you, friend. Bye now.